for just a few moments. I wanted to project just a few slides and then have a, have a little wrap up. And uh, see if we can cut those off the lights over there, please. Batch of lights. Is there ever a woman pope? Was there ever a Roman pope? A uh, woman. A Roman. No. A woman. A woman. Because Dr. Westwig in church history said something that there was a period when there was a woman pope. I wonder if you ever found that. I haven't found that one yet. Paul, have you? I, that rings a bell. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really does. And, and I, I don't remember the details, but there was that argument. Yes. Well, we'll have to check on that one a little later here. Uh, but uh, let me just, uh, can you see a bit of those if we, can we just play this? Can I just pull that, uh, this far one over here, I think I'm going to have a little bit with help. Um, but high above the banks of the Dnieper River in Kiev uh, is this statue of Prince Vladimir. He not only became a Christian in the 10th century, but went through a dramatic conversion becoming widely known for his care for the poor and the orphans, the homeless, and the sick. Next. Uh, go the other way, would you? Again, again, again. Yes. Um, <clears throat> this building, which has now survived more than 900 years, uh, is St. Sophia in Kiev. Uh, today it's a museum that's run and operated by the state. But uh, every day, thousands of people come here to observe where the church was and what it had meant uh, in that generation. Next. This is the entrance that Anne and I walk through that takes you into the monastery of the caves in Kiev. And uh, notice the elaborate icons. This is an outdoor uh, space. Next. And this is the, the churches along the banks of the Dnieper River. And it's down underneath these churches uh, that we went for the Monastery of the Caves and had this dramatic moment of seeing the, the remains of Nestor, uh, the historian, the chronicler of the church. And next. And then outside of, of Moscow is this monastery that uh, St. Sergi started, uh, the Monastery of the Holy Trinity. Uh, the, this picture I like because it captures something of, of the pilgrimage spirit that's in the Russian people. They love to make pilgrimages to places that have spiritual significance. And uh, Ann and I also saw the remains of Sergi that lays in, in, in state there from, the, from that early century. But a well sprung up uh, in that site, and people love to stop here and, and fill their containers with a bit of that holy water uh, to take back home. So that kind of mystical life is very much a part of, a part of their life. Next, please. These are the domes uh, on that, those churches in Zagorsk uh, of the Holy Trinity. Beautiful. Again, they, they liken them to flames, and we liken them sometimes to onion tops. But they're gorgeous, and they've been lovely, lovely restored, lovingly restored. Next. This is inside uh, our worship there at the church uh, in Zagorsk, the monastery. Uh, that icon of the Holy Trinity is just to the right of the, of the center as you would walk through the iconostasis there. Uh, but the crowdedness of the churches, uh, that was what we experienced always in the churches there. Next. And I like this picture because it reveals something of that devotion, that there were always uh, usually women who were, were busy lighting candles or passing candles from the back to the front or polishing the icons. Uh, a tremendous sense of devotion, uh, attention to what was going on. They were involved in worship. They were not spectators. Next. Then Ann and I, uh, with our group, uh, were way in the south in the Ukraine. We visited a rural parish that uh, hosted our group. And I don't know if you can see it, but it was a small parish, but he actually had put out a little red carpet uh, as we walked to the front of their church. Next. And inside was this Father Vasily. Uh, I mentioned him last time. He was uh, a layman that uh, the, po the bishop had found one day in his younger years and uh, asked him to prepare himself to be uh, the priest of the church. Uh, had very little education, but a great devotion and a great love for his people. Uh, he had such pride in his church. Next, uh, those on the walls, you can see some new frescoes that had been painted. 
uh, onto the walls of this little, very humble church. He also told this moving story of, of how when the German armies had retreated from, from uh, Russia, they had moved through this community and this parish, and, and such devastating things had happened. Next. I think this is a, an interesting picture. The Father Vasily in the middle, uh, the woman to his left, and the man behind were the uh, leaders of our particular group. Uh, his daughter is just to his right, uh, and then to his uh, to the left uh, are the two women from the parish. Uh, when he was speaking and kind of telling his story, they, they had such devotion, such emotion was expressed in their faces as they listened to their priest tell the story of his life and, and of their parish. And then on the far left are the two young Russian uh, women who were our guides, uh, who as far as we knew and assumed were, were well outside the pale of the Christian family, but nevertheless were extremely interested in, in the dialogues that we were having uh, and the, the conversations that we were having with people in the church. They were definitely fascinated by it. Next. And then we made a stop in Leningrad uh, to uh, one of the large parishes. Uh, this was a few of the group from our, from our group coming. Next. And uh, this was in that parish uh, serving Holy Communion. Uh, the priest here is, has a, a spoon. He is dipping in and he, he dips a bit of the bread and the wine out of there and serves uh, the parishioner. The fellow to the right looks to me like Bill Myers, but I'm sure it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Also, the, the spoon was for the babies. Yes. And, and uh, here are, here was looking out into that congregation there in Leningrad. Uh, just a sea of people that were, were there and so attentive so absolutely absorbed uh, in what was going on. Next. And this is St. Basil's, uh, which is sort of the icon building in, in downtown Moscow. Uh, you know, it's more like a circus with the, the colors and the pageantry. It's not a worshiping uh, community there any longer. Uh, but it's interesting that this St. Basil's church is still the kind of the pivotal focal point for anybody who visits Russia today. Uh, that heritage of Moscow is almost the third Rome is, is still strong. That's, that'll do it. Thank you. I want to flip those lights back clear, would you? Well, just a couple minutes to wrap up uh, where, we've, where we've been. Um, the most precious gift Orthodoxy has been able to make to the Christian West in our time has certainly been its tradition of mystical theology, its understanding of silence, and the prayers of the heart. The Church affirms St. John Chrysostom as the place of the angels, of the archangels, the kingdom of God, heaven itself. Here in this vision of heaven on earth lies the deepest inspiration of Eastern Christendom and its living heart. One final bit of good news. In 1964, Pope John XXIII was, had been in office. The Second Vatican Council issued this statement praising the Eastern Orthodox Church. Quote, the Catholic Church values highly the institution of the Eastern Churches, their liturgical rites, ecclesiastical traditions, and their ordering of Christian life. For in those churches which are distinguished by their venerable an antiquity, there is clearly evident the tradition that has come from the apostles through the fa fathers and which is part of the divinely revealed, undivided heritage of the universal church. And so it was on December 7, 1965, that the mutual excommunications of 1054 was officially removed by Pope, by Pope Paul the the sixth in Patriarch and the Pythagoras. Well, um, thank you for your attention and interest. Are there any last comments, questions, observations? Patty? Um, I wasn't able to be here last time, but I, last night I uh, watched a movie on television, on the public television called Jerusalem, and it's like a two-hour movie and it just 
it tells practically everything that Pastor Hoven was just talking about and a lot more. I really recommend it. It's called Jerusalem. And uh, it's, I watched it on Channel 24. Uh, I also was wondering if last time you had mentioned the icons that are at the Greek, Greek Orthodox Church. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, they are just wonderful. They're painted on the walls of the Greek uh, of the Orthodox Church here in Rochester. And if you ever get a chance to go in there, they are just fabulously done. That's a beautiful introduction, Patty, to the fact that Lori has uh, tentatively arranged um, for a visit to the Orthodox Church and the last Friday, perhaps, of April. And it will be announced in the bulletins, and uh, so the invitation will be, it's a ZAP event, yeah. but it will be a lunch, but then if you choose just to, to go to the church, and we may be able to piggyback another visit along with that Orthodox Church, but I plan to be part of that too, so that was a nice follow-up she offered to, to package something so that we could make that visit. So watch your bulletins for that, and, uh, and sign up or whatever you need to do when that time comes. Uh, yes, Sandy? I'm puzzled by the, um, this in uh, Section 7, when you said Cardinal Humber led Jesus' delegation to Constantinople to run the, the division results. And then this Islam threatening and uh, the East asking for help from the West, does that follow the Humbers? And, and we're, we're probably talking about an empire request. I mean, we're talking not this church requesting help. This was the empire of Byzantium uh, requesting help. I mean, they were facing the, the threat, so but the church was involved. But it was it was a bigger a bigger request than, than, than just the church, for sure. Yes. Yeah, and Paul? Just to tie Lutherans back into this, during the Reformation period, Luther... Uh, was a strong voice in defense of the Orthodox Church, the, the Eastern Church. And after a period of time, eh, probably in the late 1500s, early 1600s, there was actually a delegation sent uh, uh, from Germany to the Patriarch. And there was supposed to be a, a, a return delegation. But the war with the Turks got in the way and all that sort of stuff. But there was actually dialogue, but a, a, a minimalist but at the time, compared to what we have now. But there was a dialogue begun between the Reformation Church in Germany and the Orthodox Church because there was some real compatibility. Yes. And you really can sense this, can't you? When you especially if there's a part of our... Uh, our tradition at Zumbro that has to do with, uh, with the more mystical side of Lutheranism, you know, out of Hans Nielsen Hauge and a, and a low church emphasis, and Sweden had a kind of a pietistic emphasis that had some mysticism to it too. So yeah, there is some connecting links. It's unfortunate that something there didn't, didn't happen more vigorously early on. Any other comments? We have worship at uh, at 12 o'clock and uh, lunch that follows and thanks for coming. This has been fun for me. I enjoyed it.